All right, people, I'm Danny Baker, and this is a Six Degrees Trope Deep Dive, the Adaptational Wimp, Marvel Edition, Villain Edition, Part 2. Part 1, if you missed it, is here with cool stuff like Thor's eyebrows, boomerangs, and actors on steroids, and yes, I know it's not actually Shuma Garaf, thank you. So straight into part two, number one, it's the big bad Thanos. So we all know him now as the MCU's Infinity Saga big bad, and in the comics he's got a proper fleshed out backstory. He's a deviant eternal, but from Titan, so he's like a mutant of an eternal who are already superhuman, as seen in the Eternals movie, but he's a wrong un, hence the purple chops. So he's got their superpowers, but heightened thanks to his mutation and his genius level intellect has also helped him scientifically enhance himself. You know what else makes him harder though? The dude is in love with death, Mistress Death specifically, and he has been for ages since she was a cheeky scamp making him kill people, effectively making him a serial killer on Titan in his teenage days. Basically everything naughty he does is to impress her, does that make him a simp? Anyway at some point he gets resurrected by Death and then has even more power bestowed on him. He's basically immortal, literally living a million years into the future in one story, and he has energy manipulation and telepathic powers. When he gets the Infinity Stones in the comics, he doesn't need to move his hands to activate the stones, he just uses his mind, he's much more omniscient, apart from clicking his bloody fingers to kill half the universe. But even that was just a warm up to impress death. In anger afterwards, he inadvertently sends these shockwaves across the universe that do things like smash the rainbow bridge in Asgard. And after that, he beats up a load of cosmic entities, including Galactus, plus handling all the regular heroes. So suffice to say, he's a badass, hence why he always comes back in the comics. He's another boomeranger. <laughs> Thanos is obviously the big bad of the Infinity Saga in the MCU, and he is hard as. He beats up Hulk for fun, he even goes full WWE gorilla pressing him. So he's handy in a scrap, and he's got a mean double sword thing that he can spin in a frankly ridiculous way to deflect a supercharged Iron Man blast. He can also hold his own against Doctor Strange, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Spider-Man and Iron Man all together. He's decent. And then yeah, he gets all six stones and he's just unstoppable. And with a click of his fingers, side note, I know the whole conceit was a snap of the fingers, but it's a bit ridiculous that it's like a magic trigger and it can only be done with a snap. Like when Thor's got an axe in your chest, just make it happen. And if Captain Marvel holds your fingers apart, you can't do it? Come on. So anyway, with a click of his fingers, yes, quite literally, he dusts half the universe. Ugh, God, they really drew out Peter Parker's dusting, didn't they? So yes, that is powerful, but it pales in comparison to what he was like in the comics, both in the Infinity Gauntlet and beyond. Hopefully, with all the multiverse stuff that's happening, who knows if he'll be back. All right, in at number two, in a similar but much less powerful vein, it's one of Thanos' squad, it's Proxima Midnight. So Proxima Midnight's history is a fraction of Thanos's. She was in Thanos's Butcher Squad and then got promoted into the Black Order, changed to the children of Thanos in the movies though, with her husband Corvus, who by the way is punching well above his weight marrying Proxima. His is a face that only a mother can love. There's some hijinks with Hela at some point where she squares off against an unworthy Thor of all people, with Hela actually killing Proxima to show off to Thanos. But yeah, she's not very prolific. In the comics though, she is capable of landing on Earth from space through the atmosphere with no real issues. This happens in New York where she beats the snot out of Luke Cage for a bit. Luke Cage is a monster in terms of how hard he is, so to beat him to submission, give him a concussion and crack his ribs is no mean feat. Cage does eventually subdue her, which is mega embarrassing when Thanos calls her in for dinner. But then there's her weapon. She's got a spear that's made from a bloody sun trapped in distorted space-time acting and operating as a star, supernova and black hole all at once, of course. And so the spear as well is designed to chase its target in the comics. And it's got so much density that it actually once forced Hulk to revert back to Brucey Banner. She can even take out eight enemies in one go while chatting to her hubby about his sense of humor. So there's a few reasons why Thanos chose her to be part of his Black Order, his children of Thanos, basically his special ops team. But in the movies, Proxima is a shadow, midnight, eh, of her comic book self. I will admit, I think the decision to give her horns was a good one. The comic headpiece was a bit out there, although Hela did pull off a very similar look in Ragnarok. Fine. But yeah, to start with, her and her hubby Korva struggle against Vision and Scarlet Witch. Wanda is obviously mega powerful, even in the movie, so okay, understandable. And if Vision wasn't wounded by Corvus's glaive, then it probably would have been over a load quicker. 
Then they get into the train station and she chucks her spear at this mysterious shadowy figure behind the train and he bloody catches it and she cannot believe it. So it's clearly not like the comic spear. The dude that caught it though is Captain America with a beard, which I'm going to say adds 15% to his power. I'm pretty sure that's canon. But still, her and her spear are downgraded. Then she gets booted across the room by Falcon, who has his wings, but he is a mere man. Then she gets taken down easily by two humans and a superhuman. Even the way she crawls over to Corvus is just a bit disappointing. And then apparent Stone Cold Killer Black Widow lets him get away without just capping her. Next time we see Proxima, it's in the Battle of Wakanda, and after she's done smirking about her attack dog, she's having a fight again with one superhuman in Wanda. But then again, Black Widow and Okoye, who yes, are obviously extremely good fighters, but would not put up a fight against the comic book version who could crack Luke Cage's ribs. She does show some strength, but not the same as what's in the comics. And it was only when doing my research on Proxima that I realised she's not even in Endgame at all. I didn't realise. She doesn't even feature in the background. Then, to be fair, I think the comics version wouldn't have survived that. Someone who does feature in the final part of the Infinity Saga, though, is our number three, Proxima's hubby, Corvus Glaive. So in the comics, Corvus is in the Black Order as their leader. He's the best of the best. He's also randomly Black Dwarf's brother, the big dude called Carl Obsidian in the MCU. I wish you could see more of their home lives of these lot. You do actually get to see a bit more in the Black Order series, but does Proxima get on with her brother-in-law, especially as he fancied her once? Scandalous. Why are Black Dwarf and Corvus so different? Was it some kind of experiment like in Twins? Do I look okay? Yeah, you look great, Arnie. Anyway, he's like Proxima in the comics, superhuman strength, speed, durability, as well as being a master tactician. He's so smart and capable that when Thanos disappears after some multiverse shenanigans, he basically created his own Black Order and acted like Thanos, until the Mad Titan returned and said, nope, get out of it. So he stabs himself. He took out the X-Men by himself, he's a beast. He as well as the overall Black Order. And yes, including Black Swan, but she's not in the MCU. But his weapon, his glaive, is what makes him even more hardcore and convenient considering his surname. So the glaive itself is so sharp that it can cut atoms, God knows how. But this means he can cut Hulk skin easily. Hulk, he really doesn't do too well against this married couple. And it can also cut Hyperion skin. Hyperion being a ridiculously powerful dude who's basically the Marvel version of Superman along with Sentry. Corvus is somehow also linked to the glaive, so that if he dies, like he actually does at the hands of Hyperion in his first adventure, if you will, he can slowly come back to life if his glaive remains intact. So when Thanos and Corvus' wife are encased in amber, it's a long story, Midnight has her hubby's glaive, and the crazy inhuman Maximus fires a bit of oxygen at his bones and he comes back to life. So yes, this weapon is nuts, making Corvus pretty hard. So in the movies, he's definitely been adaptationally wimped. He starts pretty well taking down Vision with his glaive, giving him a load of trouble. I mention it in the adaptational badass video here, how it's not really explained that the glaive can hurt Vision so bad, but it does, so, so far, so threatening. But like with Proxima, once it moves to the train station, he's distracted by some mini-missiles and he's a load easier to take down than even his wife. Black Widow more than matches him and manages to stab him, which makes him unable to get up. Get up. Again. Cue them running away. Very disappointing, Corvus, mate. He comes back at Vision later in Wakanda, giving it the bigot to him. I thought you were a formidable machine, but you're dying like any man. When bloody Captain America comes and distracts him enough to get stabbed by his own glaive. They really were never going to do the whole he can't die while his glaive is intact. I get it. And the whole scene does at least show he's pretty hardcore taking down guards in Wakanda and nearly killing Cap. But my biggest gripe with how they do Corvus dirty though is in Endgame, when he's in the big bad ruckus at the end only just to get dispatched by Okoye in an instant. You can't make him such a formidable dude in Infinity War and then have him and the rest of the Black Order slash Children of Thanos as just little blips to deal with or not even feature. I mean, it was a long film already, I guess, but it's annoying. Okay, enough of the Infinity Saga. Let's get into the aftermath. It's number four, it's the Scrolls. So as mentioned in the previous video, the Scrolls in the comics are a lot scarier than what we've seen in the MCU so far. Secret Invasion, the TV show, does look like it could be good, but the fact that it's a TV show doesn't excite me enough, to be honest. I know it should. Although it does have Olivia Colman and some grimy London streets, so that is something. So the Scrolls that I want to see, the ones that are the scariest, are technically the Deviant Scrolls similar to Thanos, they're the baddest of the three kind of scroll, the other two being the Prime Scrolls, normal ones, and Eternal Scrolls, which are the scroll versions of the Eternals that we have on Earth, the basically the super versions. There was a civil war, and then the Deviants came out on top. Now, the scrolls have a long and complicated history and are interwoven into the comics deeply, too much to go into here. But their main powers are that they can shapeshift, so they can mimic people. So far, so MCU. But they can also basically act like Mr. Fantastic. They can stretch, they can make wings, they can be literal battering rams, etc. This element of shape-shifting comes into play when they invade Earth. They've kidnapped a load of heroes and they've had Skrull imposters living as them for ages. It's discovered when Elektra's killed and it's only a bloody Skrull. This kicks off the secret invasion storyline, which I love. 
Throughout this, we also meet the Super Scroll race, the first of which being Clert. Clert? Clert? <laughs> anyway, a scroll soldier who's got the powers of all the Fantastic Four. But in Secret Invasion, they're basically just scrolls with powers nicked from all the Marvel characters. So you get these amazing fights where Black Panther takes down a scroll that's a mix of Wolverine, Luke Cage, Bullseye, and Iron Fist, because Black Panther's the best. The bits where the scrolls are torturing Mr. Fantastic and the rest of the Illuminati are imprinted on my brain. Just them being right horrible little bastards, all so indifferent to what they're doing. As well as all these powerhouse scrolls, there's even one that has all the powers of the best X-Men for crying out loud. So in the MCU when they announced them in Captain Marvel, I was pretty excited and whilst I like the twist in that they're actually nice and they're just persecuted by the horrible Kree, and I bloody love Ben Mendelsohn, fucking Animal Kingdom, man. I don't have a computer. Don't need a computer. Overall, they were just a bit of a disappointment. So far, they're fine, they're just a bit meh. Talos is used for comedic effect. The cat? <coughs> this isn't what you're afraid of, is it? That's not a cat. It's when he was a lot more badass in the comics. The train fight, you see a slight bit of badassery, so I have hopes for the future, I guess. We will see in the TV show. Okay, we're at number five in our Villains Part 2 list. She's got her own theme song. It's been Agatha all along. So the first in our list that in the adaptation to the MCU has actually become a villain. Agatha Harkness in the comics is actually a hero. She's an absolute mistress when it comes to magic. Maybe better than the Sorcerer Supreme Doctor Strange himself. She certainly thinks so, claiming to have been practicing magic for centuries while Strange was just a twinkle in his dad's eye. Her origins are much the same as the MCU. She was around during the Salem Witch Trials, but she's old enough to apparently remember when Atlantis sunk. She also makes with this geezer the Scryer, who's some cosmic dude who is older than the universe. So she's a hero in the comics, working with the Fantastic Four a lot, babysitting old Franklin Richards, someone who is insanely powerful, putting the god kid to sleep when needed, and she's taught the Scarlet Witch how to be a witch before it got a bit complicated. So Agatha Harkness in the comics is basically immortal and just knows magic insanely well. She helps the Silver Surfer by getting rid of this kind of virus from the other, who's a big alien baddie, not the weird servant of Thanos in the Avengers movies with six fingers. She takes on big bad Dormammu at one point to help Wanda escape some trouble. She can manipulate dimensions. She's died, she's been resurrected a couple of times. She's badass. So whilst Catherine Han is undoubtedly a legend. I want to roll you into a little ball and shove you up my vagina. You could just live there. It's warm and it's, it's cozy. And your vagina? I want to walk around with you in there and just know you. Whenever I feel a little tickle or scratch, that it's just your hair uh. on my vagina. Please, just do it for me. What's happening? She's not quite as shit hot as the comics version. She's obviously pretty powerful. She's been around a while since Salem again, where she shows some pretty cool powers to take out her witchy sisters. And she starts off being a bit of trouble to Wanda, but the problem is that she's very reliant on the old Darkhold, and her main driving force in the TV show is to find out how Wanda made such a cool hex that she couldn't do. Not very impressive. And once Wanda goes all full Scarlet Witch, she dispatches her very easily. Agatha's obviously got her own series coming up, so maybe the MCU will give her a bit of an upgrade. Side note on old Wanda Maximoff, I wish there was some consistency in her powers in Doctor Strange 2, where she's basically the big bad. In one scene, she's got the reality warping powers to remove someone's mouth. What mouth? in another comically bad representation of Black Bolt. But when she's attacking Camotage, it's all blast from her hands. Just make everyone have no mouths or noses and they'll all drop dead. Not quite as exciting, I get, but still. And I'm sure someone will give me some actual reasons why she didn't do that. So bringing us home in at number six, it's a major character in both comics and MCU. It's the God of Mischief, Loki. So first up, Loki is a great character in the MCU. His show was great and he's been consistently good in the movies. Dark World was garbage and Ragnarok being a slight disservice to him, but more on that in a bit. In the comics, it's much like in the MCU. He's obviously not as strong as his brother. I mean, his brother is Thor, so of course not. But in the comics, he's still a lot stronger than what we've seen on screen. Down to being an Asgardian, but also a frost giant. So he once knocked a building down with one punch. He's matched Silver Surfer for strength. Bloody Rogue can't drain his powers. And Spidey's punches do nothing. And I mean when he punches full strength, not when he's holding back against Doc Ock. Thanks for pointing that out, guys. I'll stop complaining about it. But whilst he's never been as strong as Thor, he's always been the Don at magic. One of the best in the Marvel Universe. He's matched and worried Doctor Strange in some magic duels. He hurts the big dog Surtur with a blast one time. He one-shots a load of X-Men. As the Respect thread subreddit says, Respect, Loki, Marvel 616. Unfortunately, in the MCU, like I said, while he's great, he's not quite as hardcore as the comics. He's clearly strong. He can lift people up and throw them about. He whooped Captain America in the first Avengers easily. Famously took that beating from Hulk without turning to absolute mush. <laughs> Puny God. 
And he held his own against Thor a couple of times. But Valkyrie took him down easily. But the biggest annoyance for me was how Thanos just snapped his neck. Thanos is tough, we've established this, but that wouldn't have happened in the comics. Finally, his magic. In the movies, they've mainly dialed up that trickster element. He's great at mimicry. Much better. Whoa creating copies of himself, etc. But the way Doctor Strange treats him in Ragnarok like he's this little annoyance. Don't think for one minute you second rate. All right, bye bye. Show the man some respect. He got his magic after an elf saved his life, taught him magic, and then Loki repaid him by sacrificing him to get all his magic. Anyway, through most of Ragnarok, he's treated like a bit of comic relief, and I don't like it. Get help! Please! My brother's dying! Get help! Help him! Oh, classic. Okay, our six are finished. A special mention to Batrock the Leaper, made so much cooler in the movies at first because it's bloody GSP and his fight with Cap in the Winter Soldier is great. But in the TV show, he gets taken down by a mere human, yes, with a jetpack thing, but with no powers. Whereas in the comics, he's given Wolverine a run for his money and he's literally about to kill Sam Wilson after beating him up at one point. GSP also randomly promoting some calisthenic equipment that I can confirm is actually very good. So we've done it. Six more villains that the MCU has adapted to be a little bit more rubbish. All understandable before you start shouting at me in the comments. And I want to give a big shout out to the Respect Threads subreddit for a great catalogue of why you should respect these characters more. As before, if you like this video, smash the like and smash subscribe, yeah? See, I matched Cap's lips saying it again, yeah? Effort on that. Anyway, stay tuned for the third part in this series, the Hero Edition. And if you haven't watched the first part of the Villain Edition, you can find it here. And until next time, I'm Danny Baker. This was a Six Degrees Trope Deep Dive, and I'll see you later.